welcome and thank you for joining again. This is Humayun Aryan. It's great to have you all. Uh, it's great to have today's speaker. And great pleasure to introduce him, Dr. Drew Turner from John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Drew got his undergraduate degree in engineering physics at Embry Riddle Aeronautical University in 2005. He then received his PhD in Aerospace Engineering Sciences in 2010 from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Drew conducted his PhD research at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics under the supervision of Professor Jingling Li. After his PhD, Drew worked at UCLA with Vesalis and then in the Space Sciences Department in Aerospace Engineering. at the Aerospace Corporation before joining the Space Physics Group of the Space Exploration Sector at the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Drew is humbled to have held the honor of serving on the science teams of NASA, Themis, Van Allen Probes, MMS, LFIN, GTO, GTO SAT missions, and he is currently serving as the deputy project scientist on NASA's IMAP mission. Drew was a student instrument lead on the reptile instrument on CSS WE CubeSat. He is deputy PI of UCLA Elfin CubeSat mission, PI of the micro charged particle telescope on aerospace's AeroCube 10 mission. PI of the uh, micro dosimeter suit on the Cupid mission, and the PI of the relativistic electron magnet magnetic spectrometer on GTO SAT. But now he's serving as a deputy PI alongside Christine on that mission. Drew's science interests include planetary radi radiation belts, particle acceleration processes in collisionless plasmas, and planetary magnetospheres, and the physics of collisionless fast magnetosonic shocks. Today, he will be talking to us about radiation belts. Um, just before he starts, I would like to remind you, as always, that this presentation is recorded, so please keep yourself muted. If you have questions, send them to myself on the chat or post them in the group chat. Uh, Dr. Drew Turner, thank you for accepting our presentation. Uh, ac uh, invitation, please go ahead when you read. All right. Thanks, Homan. That was a really nice introduction. Um, just want to confirm everyone can hear me and see the slides. Yes, we can see them. Awesome. All right. Um, and thanks also, David and Kyle, for uh, the invitation to participate and, and contribute to this lecture series. It's um, genuinely a great honor. So I've been asked to talk about radiation belts. Um, I have a generic there as radiation belts because I'm going to transition uh, into the end towards some of the radiation belts at other planetary systems and then some speculation on um, other systems in the cosmos. I, and I just want to stress too that this talk is difficult to, to fit into an hour. I have a lot of material here, so I'll be breezing over some aspects pretty quickly. Um, and spending some time on others. Um, but overall, the, the material wrapped up in these slides is would, would easily fit into a semester long course. Um, so I apologize up front for having to go quickly through some of it. All right, so this is the outline. Um, I'll get right into it with the history and background now. Okay, so I think a lot of people have seen this picture. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse, but I think a lot of people have seen this picture here of Pickering, Van Allen, and Von Braun uh, holding up the Explorer 1. Um, uh, this is a model of that first American uh, satellite. Um, what I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate is that the Americans um, with, with Explorer 1 were not actually the first to observe the radiation belts, but they just became the first to report on them. Uh, Vernov et al. Um, in Russia at the Moscow State University's Institute of Nuclear Physics uh, had some experiments on the first Sputnik spacecraft, um, Sputnik 2, which was the first one that actually observed the radiation belts, um, and then some data from Sputnik 3 here. 
I, so interestingly, with the history here, the Soviets were actually the first to observe it. However, um, due to some very interesting geopolitics at the time, uh, the Americans actually ended up being the first ones to report the discovery of the radiation belts. So I think it's always nice to list um, Vernov and Chudikov here right alongside Ben Allen and Frank with that very famous nature paper. Um, so getting into uh, this kind of kind of classic picture of the radiation belts. This is, of course, Earth's electron radiation belts. Um, as we just saw, they were discovered in 1958, which was quite the surprise at the time that there were these pockets of, of very intense radiation in, in near Earth space. Um, and what they quickly discovered was that the uh, radiation belts were indeed trapped particles within the geomagnetic field of near Earth space. And this two belt structure for the electrons in particular um, was developed very early on. I mean, it was right there in that uh, nature paper that I showed from Ben Allen, um, in which you have an inner radiation belt and an outer radiation belt separated by a, a, a relatively empty slot region um, for these tens of keV to kind of 10 MeV electrons. Um, and as I'm going to elaborate on in the course of this talk, that picture has really evolved um, in particular over the last decade with the launch of the Van Allen probes and that, uh, that very successful mission. So I think most people are quite familiar with Earth's magnetosphere. Um, so starting on the left here, this lion uh, plot or figure. Uh, we have the magnetosphere itself here, of course, um, bathed in the solar wind, the supersonic solar wind that forms that bow shock on the upstream side. Uh, the compressed day side and then elongated magneto tail and focusing in here now on the inner magnetosphere. So inside of about 10 Earth radii and coming over to the plot here on the right, um, this is a nice cartoon from the Van Allen probe science gateway that just shows some of the important physical processes that we've identified. I, I've circled around these ones pertaining to acceleration and loss. Um, this is, of course, for largely based around the electron radiation belts, though I will discuss a little bit on protons. And um, what we have here is you can see basically this, this wide range of physical phenomena that are occurring in the inner magnetosphere and how those affect both the acceleration and loss of these radiation belt electrons. I'll be discussing a lot of these during the talk today. Uh, so we'll just move on quickly from there. Um, as further background on the physics itself now, um, when we're discussing energetic particles in the inner magnetosphere, so we're talking about electron energies of more than a couple hundred keV, the motion in the inner magnetosphere is dominated by the V cross B uh, part of the Lorentz force. Um, so that means that the electric fields are relatively insignificant compared to, of course, that very large velocity and relatively large magnetic field. Um, so the other uh, very interesting and valid point to mention here is that these are indeed true test particles. There are way too few of them in the radiation belts, um, the radiation belt energies in particular. There are way too few of these to significantly contribute to self-consistency of the global electric and magnetic fields. And that's, that's a really important point is we can get away with uh, quite a lot of, of very important simplifications and assumptions um, because of that point. Now, in, as you can see from the, the video that's playing here, um, this is a simulation of a uh, 10 MeV proton at L of four. So uh, equatorial distance there of that magnetic field of four Earth radii um, in a dipole representation of the geomagnetic field. Um, I've ch chosen a 10 MeV proton to show here so that you can actually see these characteristic periodic motions. You have gyration around the field lines, which is from the, the V cross B force you have bounce between mirror points um, and that arises from uh, basically any kind of parallel velocity that you have. Um, and, and then the convergence of the field towards the poles, you end up getting this mirroring force and, and bouncing motion uh, back and forth between higher latitudes. And then you can also see the gradient curvature drift here. Um, so this is the azimuthal drift of the, the particle around the system. So those three characteristic motions, those three uh, periodic motions in particular, the gyro uh, motion, the bounce motion, and the gradient curvature drifts, um, those are critical to understanding this talk. Uh, and the reason for that is associated with each of those, you can define these Hamiltonian action integrals. 
which we know very well as the adiabatic invariants. And what these are, are in this, in this physical system, these are constants of that motion um, with the first adiabatic invariant mu related to the gyro motion, second adiabatic invariant J, or as we, I'll be using throughout here, K, which is, you can see directly related to J there, um, uh, associated with the bounce motion, and then the third adiabatic invariant phi, which I'll be actually using L star, um, again, related to phi there, uh, it related to the gradient curvature drift. These are three of the characteristic time scales for a representative electron. This is a one MeV electron near geosynchronous orbit. You can see that the gyro motions on the kilohertz uh, frequency scale, the bounce motion there is uh, bouncing back and forth on the order of seconds. And I should say too, this is for a 60 degree equatorial pitch angle electron. And then you're looking at millihertz, so much longer time scales on the order of like 15 minutes or so for the, the curvature, the uh, gradient curvature drift around the Earth. But keep in mind, this is around the Earth at geosynchronous orbit, which is 6.6 .6 RE. And to go around the Earth uh, in only 15 minutes um, it tells you right away these things are moving very quickly. These are relativistic electrons moving near the speed of light. Um, some other important definitions, it's just the pitch angle um, here, which is the angle between the particle's velocity and the local magnetic field vector. And then, of course, you can break that up into a parallel velocity and a perpendicular velocity. Um, and then also the loss cone, and this is, this is very important. So when you look at uh, basically the, the uh, perpendicular and parallel velocities here, you can define the trapping region in which the mirror points of these trapped particles are outside of Earth's atmosphere, or even if you were to go to extremes inside the Earth itself. And where the uh, parallel velocity becomes so strong that the mirror point moves into the atmosphere or lower, that's what is then the loss cone, uh, because particles with those pitch angles will be lost within one bounce of um, uh, of their motion because of collisions basically with the atmosphere. Um, so that's a really important term as well. And then because of the drift motion, I should distinguish there's bounce loss cone, which would be lost within one bounce of these particles uh, because of atmospheric collisions. But there's also a drift loss cone because of the asymmetry of, of Earth's field uh, in which a particle can bounce multiple times, but once it gets to a certain longitude, uh, because of the asymmetry, again, of the field um, and the offset of Earth's dipole moment in the center of the Earth, um, you can actually get precipitation uh, at a particular longitude, and we know that is the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, uh, and it's actually a conjugate point to that, really. Uh, and that's the drift loss cone. So basically, a particle can drift around, but it will never make it the full way around the Earth before precipitating. Um, now, the key thing with these invariants, because I'm going to bring these up again and again, any significant changes in the magnetic field or electric field, and by that I mean waves, at time scales faster than or comparable to these periodic motions will violate the corresponding adiabatic invariant. And that's really important for the theory. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on the irradiation belt, so I'm going to breeze over this quite quickly. Um, but the, for irradiation belt protons um, and some energies of electrons, the dominant source is um, from cosmic rays interacting with the atmosphere. Um, this process is known as CRAND, which is cosmic ray albedo neutron decay. And basically what happens here is you have these greater than tens of MeV cosmic ray ions raining down upon the atmosphere um, from space. When those ions interact with the atmosphere, they can knock free neutrons um, uh, from the atmospheric uh, atoms and those neutrons can carry away a significant amount of the uh, incident cosmic ray energy. Um, it's estimated that about 10% of those free neutrons will actually leave the atmosphere. They'll, they'll shoot away from the atmosphere into space. Um, that's why they're known as albedo neutrons. Um, those neutrons have a decay half-life of about, about 10 minutes. And that, uh, along with their energy, of course, dictates the, the distance that that neutron will travel away from the Earth, from the atmosphere prior to decaying. When that neutron does decay, it decays into uh, three products. There's a proton, which ends up carrying most of the energy. There's an electron and then an electron antineutrino. Um, and like I said, the proton ends up carrying most of that neutron's uh, energy, which of course came initially from the cosmic ray. 
And this is how you get the proton radiation belt. Um, but th those electrons also do carry a significant amount of the energy. Um, and you can get some electrons in the inner radiation belt from that as well. And I'll, I will talk about that in a little bit. Um, there are some great references here. Uh, and of course, all of those leading into th these uh, research um, uh, listed here. Um, in particular, most recently, there was a nature paper um, from uh, Shinlin Lee et al. with CubeSat data that has actually proven um, the, the first direct measures, I should say indirect measures of crammed neutron densities. So that's a really neat one to check out. Okay, um, getting back into some of the basic physics, uh, associated with those adiabatic invariants, um, you, can base, you can define a model of uh, Fokker-Planck equations to describe the evolution of the distribution function of, of particles in this trapped um, quasi-adiabatic system. Uh, the most general uh, form of that model is the diffusion equation shown here, where F is the phase space density of the electrons, that's the distribution function, and its time variable, a time rate of change, um, is equal to this diffusion equation, where uh, this is a diffusion coefficient, dJ, uh, J, and these J terms here with I being one through three are the adiabatic invariants. So those, those um, constants of the, the periodic motion. Um, an example of this is shown down here with one, one dimension. So this is a one dimensional uh, diffusion equation um, written out for, the, uh, for L. And this is uh, the third adiabatic invariant. Um, right here in the equation, it's L, but uh, this is just L star. Um, and then there's a loss term that's been added here. But if you start with this initial distribution in blue and you evolve this diffusion uh, model in time with the diffusion coefficient that's proportional to L to the 10th, you can see how this initial peak in the distribution um, will smooth out over time so that you end up getting uh, this distribution shown in red. Um, that's just simple one dimensional radial diffusion. Uh, diffusion wants to smooth out gradients in your phase space density profiles basically. Now, how does this work? When you have small disturbances present, so waves, the particles get random kicks from those waves. If the kicks are Gaussian in distribution, that they should average, those kicks should average to zero. And in that case, um, really what you're looking at with the equation is that the diffusion coefficient is very small. So here, only gradients in the phase space um, density profile will actually play a key role, uh, so long as that, that diffusion constant or diffusion coefficient is indeed finite. However, however, if the kicks you have from the waves um, are at particular frequencies, then you can have resonance that occurs with some particles. Um, when resonance occurs, this is the resonance uh, condition here, then your diffusion coefficient can actually blow up and become very significant. And at that point, you can have enhanced um, uh, diffusion. So um, there are several key assumptions that, of course, go into quasi-linear diffusion theory. Um, one is that the waves are low amplitude and incoherent, which means they have un unstructured spectra. Uh, and uh, even more drive or assumptions go into the driving of diffusion coefficients. But nature, of course, is more complicated than this. This is just a model that's proven quite successful, um, though it is still indeed a model. Um, but from this model, we, we learned some very important things. So what I have here, um, this is a uh, nice figure from Spritz et al showing how phase space density uh, distributions for fixed first and second adiabatic invariants versus L star, so versus the third adiabatic invariant or radial distance away from the earth, um, you get some really nice telltale uh, distribution uh, evolution that will tell, tell you about what's actually causing the, evol or the, the distribution to do that. Um, for loss processes, you can have gradual loss at all L shells in which your distribution here initially in gray just drops over time. Uh, you can have outward radial diffusion or outward transport, which will end up resulting in these peaked distributions, um, uh, which then the peak moves inward to lower L shell over time. And then you can have fast localized loss in which the initial distribution shown again in gray here shows this deepening localized minima. Um, same thing can be true for source processes. Uh, these are now from Chen et al. Nature Physics. And the time evolution of the phase space density, again, can tell you very important things about the sources in the system. For instance, inward radial diffusion requires that you have some um, enhancement or some peak in your distribution at the outer boundary. 
from which you can have inward radial diffusion and a source at lower L, uh, L shells. Local acceleration, if you were to locally accelerate a particular pocket of, of the population, then you should get a, a growing peak in phase space density, which would then diffuse away from that peak over time. And then you can have an on-off source at higher L shell in which you turn on the source, um, causing uh, basically the, the favorable conditions for inward radial diffusion, and then turn that off again. Um, and over basically in that time history, you'd end up with a peak distribution um, since you've turned the source on and off at the higher L. Um, but these, looking at the, the time evolution of phase space density for constant adiabatic invariance is, is a, a key, key piece of physics um, and observational, basically, uh, um, things in the observations we can look for um, to understand what's happening in the radiation belts. That's going to be a key theme here. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I'm already uh, probably over on my introduction. Um, but this now gets into wave particle interactions, which are another critical aspect uh, to, to understand. I already mentioned how resonance and the resonance condition with waves in the system can result in enhanced diffusion, right? Um, and that diffusion doesn't just have to be radial diffusion. You can get pitch angle and energy diffusion um, uh, from resonance with, with uh, natural plasma waves as well. Um, some good examples are electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves and some important examples, I should say, for the radiation belt electrons and Whistler mode waves, um, which are, of course, both generated naturally in anisotropic uh, magnetospheric plasmas. Um, some good review papers for this, uh, Suratani and Lakina um, reviews in Geophysics 97 and then Thorne et al. in GRL 2010. Uh, these are some good ones. Again, I'm racing through some of these slides, but uh, with the video, you guys should be able to hopefully use these as a good reference. Um, wave particle interactions have now been observed directly, and that came out of Van Allen probes. So I just wanted to mention that Fennel et al. paper here. Uh, these are really important, um, and I've highlighted some of the, the key ones here for both acceleration and loss of outer belt electrons um, via quasi-linear diffusion and nonlinear interactions. Um, some examples, uh, inward radial diffusion, which can be enhanced by drift resonance with ULF waves, some good references there. Gyro resonance with Whistler mode chorus. Now, these are two examples of gyro, oops, gyro resonance um, here. This is normal resonance in which an electron, or a, it's a right-handed uh, particle, um, has a head-on collision, so to say, with a, a wave that's moving in the opposite direction. You can see that the V parallel of the particle here is opposite V phase of the wave. Um, or you can have anomalous resonance in which a, say, left-handed particle like the ion shown here um, actually overtakes an op opposite chirality wave, so right-handed wave. Um, for electrons, this actually happens with EMIC waves. Uh, EMIC waves are a left-handed wave. Electrons are, of course, right-handed uh, chirality around the field. And um, the, the particle actually overtakes the wave, uh, which then Doppler shifts it such that you can have resonance. Um, so that's what I mean by the gyro resonance there. Now, for Whistler mode chorus waves, um, that can actually cause acceleration of radiation belt electrons. Um, Landau resonance with magnetosonic waves have also been identified for potential acceleration mechanism. And then for loss, um, you can have slow energy and pitch angle dependent scattering with Hiss waves. That's another uh, Whistler mode wave that uh, is found in the plasma sphere. You can have very rapid um, energy and, and pitch angle dependent scattering with EMIC waves, that uh, anomalous resonance like I just mentioned. And then you can have outward radial diffusion and transport from um, resonance with ULF waves. All right. Some of uh, two of very many uh, of the kind of fundamental um, papers to just introduce quickly. One is Lyons and Thorne, 1973, which established uh, a model for the two zone structure of Earth's radiation belt electrons. Um, they did that with this simple uh, one dimensional radial diffusion equation. Um, including a loss term there where the loss represented losses from interactions with plasmaspheric hiss. And what they found is this two zone structure um, very nicely matched uh, this very simple model, this equilibrium model, where the energy dependence on the interaction with the, the hiss waves actually resulted in the formation of this slot region. 
um, and the two zone structure for these relativistic electrons. And then another really, really uh, key paper to understand is Kennel and Petschek um, from 1966 in JGR. And what this one focused on was the self-limiting intensities of via wave particle interactions um, in, in magnetospheric and trapped plasmas. Uh, and this one really comes down to how a plasma population will actually check itself um, by generating waves that will then cause precipitation and uh, escape into the loss cone. Um, so that's another key one, and this will come up later on when I talk about some of the other planets. Okay. Now, that was a really insufficient um, introduction to radiation belt physics and some of the history of the radiation belt electrons up to uh, about 1990 or so. Um, and then enter CRESS, the CRESS mission and the SAMPEX mission. And these two really caused a paradigm shift in radiation belt physics and were fundamental in developing the field to the point of, of proposing the Van Allen probes mission. Um, with these new uh, spacecraft, new at the time, right, in the early 90s, there were some surprising observations. Um, one of those came from CRESS, which was with shock injections, in which an interplanetary shock hit the magnetosphere, and CRESS observed this in uh, these very high energy um, electron channels. Um, at quite low L shells, as you can see here. Um, so this was a shock injection, and then the uh, resonance, basically, um, the, the, the drift resonance uh, associated um, after that, as those particles drifted around the system. Um, what Shinlin Lee was able to do in his 93 GRL was actually reproduce that with the simulation, in which he simulated the electric field, the azimuthal electric field pulse from the fast magnetosonic wave moving through the magnetosphere after being it was hit by the shock, the interplanetary shock, um, and showed that indeed with these test particles, you could reproduce the CRESS observations. Um, another thing that was observed by CRESS and SAMPEX was very sudden enhancements um, that were really too fast for inward radial diffusion to explain. And what that led to was this theory of rapid local acceleration, which pr was proposed by Mike Temrin, uh, Richard Horn and Thorne, and then Danny Summers um, in these really seminal papers. Um, and it took until Van Allen probes to prove that this is indeed happening. Uh, and then extreme variability too. So this is now SAMPEX data. I just showed CREST data on the last slide. These are SAMPEX data combined with some of the CSSWE uh, um, observations from the, the Colorado CubeSat. Um, but what you can see here is two solar cycles worth of outer radiation belt variability of these, these uh, two MeV electrons. And key thing here is this extreme variability of the inner boundary, the outer boundary, and then the intensities within the belt itself um, are just something that the theory and modeling is really challenged to accurately predict and explain. Um, and again, this, this kind of long-term picture like this was really enabled by a mission like SAMPEX, which, which was you know, up there for a long time and actually could observe this variability in the system. Uh, you can see some of the key things on this plot too that Shinlin has put together, including the associate or the correlation, I should say, between uh, solar wind speed shown in red here and the intensity of the outer radiation belt, the solar cycle dependence, which this is sunspot number shown in black, um, with the intensity of the belt. Uh, there's some other things too that I, I will not get into here. Um, but just for some human perspective, the, the order of magnitude variations that we're talking about here are, it would be analogous to say if you had $100,000 in your bank account, and then a couple hours later, if that all of a sudden unexpectedly just went to $1, um, I think you'd be pretty interested in finding out why uh, that changed so quickly. And that's exactly what we're talking about, that, that kind of orders of magnitude variation on those time scales. All right, so now enter Van Allen probes, and this is getting into the heart of the talk. I'll spend most of the time on um, some mostly observational results from Van Allen probes mission. Um, this was a two spacecraft mission that was launched in August, 2012. Uh, they were identically instrumented spacecraft in GTO-like, so geotransfer-like orbits. Um, at, and they were held at different separations over uh, the course of the mission. And that was specifically designed um, 
uh, with the orbits and the instrumentation to answer some of the outstanding questions in radiation belt physics. So these, I'm gonna show three slides, just again, highlighting the extreme variability, um, but then also some of the energy dependencies in the radiation belt electrons. Uh, so these are 1.8 MeV electrons measured by REPT on uh, the two Van Allen probes. And I'm gonna call these the core radiation belt energies. So by core, I mean one to two MeV or so, um, kind of just the classic uh, outer belt population that we think of. L shell here is shown on the Y axis. And then this is time over the course of the mission. And these have been put together by Allison Jane. So I need to thank her for this because this is the full mission for Van Allen probes. So it continues on here. Um, you can see the years changing and going up here uh, to the end of the mission there in October, 2019. And again, you can see this extreme variability, right? In the intensity, the inner edge of the belt, as well as the outer el uh, edge, which you can make out sometimes with Van Allen probes, but often the outer edge of the uh, outer belt is beyond the, the Van Allen probes apogee. Um, so this is 1.8 MeV electrons. The next slide here shows something very different for 7.7 .7 MeV electrons. Um, this is actually the, the highest um, uh, energy that was really observed for electrons in the outer belt during Van Allen probes era. Um, and then if we go to, uh, it's, it looks like someone annotated the screen maybe, I don't know if everyone can see that. Um, if we go to mag ice, which covered a broad range uh, of lower energies below the rept um, instrument up to an overlapping with the rept energies, um, you can see again, the energy dependence on this variability. So this is 110 keV up in energy to 3.6 MeV here. I'm gonna see if I can make that go away. Does anyone else see this red line? Yes, we can see it. That's weird. I don't know where that came from. All right, ignore the red line. <laughs> but anyway, there's um, some extreme uh, energy dependence on the variability of the outer belts as well, um, and the inner belt. And I'll talk about some of these uh, slot filling injections and, and um, variation on the inner belt as well. All right, so now with Van Allen probes, what do we know? Uh, the picture has definitely evolved. Um, we're talking about tens of keV to about eight MeV electrons uh, for the electron radiation belt system. Um, one thing that I'm gonna highlight here is that the inner radiation belt uh, really only had up to about 1.5 MeV electrons at observable levels that we can report on from Van Allen probes. There was not an inner radiation belt at higher energies than that. Um, the outer radiation belts, and I'm highlighting the S there um, because there can be several of them. I, exhibit the extreme variations like I've just been highlighting. Um, and those variations are indeed very energy dependent. And then the slot region here uh, is also highly energy and activity dependent. Sometimes at certain energies, it's actually not there at all. And I'll talk about that first as we get into the uh, interradiation belt electrons after this one slide on protons. Um, so just to give protons their, their uh, fair coverage here, um, these are some observations from the uh, RPS uh, instrument on Van Allen probes alongside data from OV120, which are from 1971. The key point here is that the peak in the inner radiation belt um, shown in this greater than 65 MeV integral channel, note the units, and then this 390 to 450 MeV uh, differential channel, again, note the units, the peaks there between OV120 in 1971 and RPS data from 2013 are remarkably comparable. Um, so the peak of the inner belt at these energies for protons is very stable. And Joe Mazur covered that in a 2014 uh, AGU fall meeting report. Um, however, as you can see here, and also in this uh, figure from Selesnik and Albert uh, that was um, published last year, at L greater than 1.5, um, there's actually a shoulder and or peak um, that is temporally vari variable for these uh, tens of MeV to hundreds of MeV protons. Um, these are being affected by solar energetic protons uh, and particle events, um, which act as an injection source for these inner radiation belt protons. Um, and what Selesnik and Albert were able to show, you can see there's data and model um, uh, uh, data on here, um, is that that uh, that peak basically, or that injection source from the SEPs um, then diffuses over time, which is what their model is. It's the radial diffusion model, um, including loss terms. 
Um, and you can see how the model fits quite well with the observations from Ben Allen probes. And that's all I'm going to say about interradiation about protons. Moving to the electrons, starting with what I already alluded to, um, Joe Fennell, Shinlin Lee in the same year uh, published results from MAGICE uh, and REPT um, uh, respectively. Um, basically independent instrument results showing that there were no observable levels of electrons with energy greater than 1.5 MeV in the inner zone. Now what Seth was able to do, and I have the wrong year here, I should have uh, 2019, I believe. Um, what Seth Claude Pierre was able to show in his paper, which this figure is from here, is that that result is, was true for the entirety of the Van Allen probes era. There were no observable levels of electrons with energy greater than 1.5 MeV in the inner zone. So you might ask, why didn't we know that before? And the reason why is those protons, like I just showed on the previous slide, were penetrating through instrument shields on older instruments and current instruments and looking like electrons. So they were activating electron channels, even though it was really just protons coming through the shielding of the, of the instrument. Um, so with Van Allen probes and the instrumentation that was specifically designed to work in that population of very high energy protons, we were able to show that the electrons being measured there were actually just proton uh, contamination. Um, above again, I should say this 1.5 MeV range. Uh, as you can see from the lower energies in this Claude Pierre et al. plot, there is indeed an interradiation belt electron population up to, like I said, up to about 1.5 MeV, above which, as you can see from the 2.6 MeV plot here, there is no uh, interradiation belt. Um, so that's most definitely a key finding. Now, if we focus in on the lower energies, one of the other really surprising things from Van Allen probes were these sudden particle enhancements at low L shells. And I'm going to focus in, this is a really nice paper from Hong Zhao, um, focus in on this panel right here. So these are 140 keV electrons, again, L shell in time. And what you can see is the slot region, this kind of classic two zone radiation belt structure is regularly interrupted by these very sudden enhancements through the slot region of these, you know, hundreds of keV electrons. Um, what we were able to show in this JGR 2017 paper um, was we counted up these, these flux enhancements in the slot region, these, these floods basically of electrons in the slot region. Uh, and that's what this is showing. This is just number of those events versus electron energy. Consistent with the fact that there's no no observable belt greater than 1.5 MeV in the inner zone. Uh, you can see that it's um, exponentially more likely as you go to lower energies to have these slot filling enhancement events. And you can also see that comparing the 20 keV electrons here to the 140 keV electrons here to the 900 here from the, uh, the Zhao et al. results. Interestingly, these are not also observed for the same energies of protons. And that tells you right away that they're not simply the result of enhanced global convection. Um, we also looked into loss processes for the protons, in particular from charge exchange, and uh, we were able to show that um, uh, that was definitely not uh, uh, a factor in why we were not observing these for the protons. Um, we also knew that these were localized. So we had all of these, you know, kind of uh, pieces to the puzzle, and yet we, ha we hadn't put together what exactly caused these. Um, in particular, because they were happening much faster than can be explained by inward radial diffusion. But what we do know from that 2017 paper is that these low L shell injections are actually the dominant source of tens to hundreds of keV electrons in the inner belt. Um, I'm going to breeze over these details pretty quickly, but uh, what we're showing here are these are distributions, phase space density distributions versus L star for fixed first and second adiabatic invariance. These are statistics on those distributions over this, these full periods here, which were quiet times in the magnetosphere. And what you see is these peaked distributions. And that's key because this is phase space density. This is not flux. These peaks mean that any inward radial diffusion um, from out here in the outer belt is not actually penetrating all the way into the inner radiation belt. That, that cannot result in a peak distribution. You need a monotonically increasing distribution to have that. However, when you have these spells, these sudden particle enhancements at low L shells, what you get is 
a very sudden, and I'm talking just a couple hours or so or less, flood of electrons in, through the slot region, resulting in those monotonic uh, uh, enhancing, sorry, monotonically increasing um, distributions versus L star. Um, at which point you can then have radial diffusion that would cause a source for the inner belt electrons. I, but the initial injection itself is way too fast for radial diffusion to explain. Um, so we had to, to try and figure out how those uh, were happening. And, and again, some of the, the first ones to really highlight th these pieces of evidence were this uh, Turner et al. GRL 2015, the Jow et al. Uh, 2017 um, papers. Now, Sam Califf and Céline Lejeune came along and said, well, uh, we do have some electric fields in the intermagnetosphere that might explain these injections, why they are specific to electrons and not affecting protons, why they're only affecting uh, these kind of, why there's a strong energy dependence, I should say, on just how far in L shell these are being transported um, and why they can result in localized injections. These were all those pieces of the puzzle. Um, and what they said basically is these uh, enhanced convectional electric, localized uh, electric fields during active times, um, uh, SAPs being a prime example there, can actually cause these injections. Um, and the, the model is really nicely defined in both of these papers, so I'm just going to point you there and move on. Um, another thing too was if you look at how the two belt structure reforms after one of these sudden particle enhancements at low L shells, that's entirely consistent with those losses by plasmaspheric hiss. Um, we did know that these injections were happening inside the plasmasphere. And then over the course of multiple days after the in injection, um, you actually end up carving back out that slot feature. Uh, that's shown really nicely here in this Reeves et al. Um, study. These are observations. So this is kind of taking the energy distribution, turning it a bit on its head. So this is energy shown on the y-axis, L shells shown on the, uh, the x-axis. And then these are just different orbits. So they're these distributions of these electrons from different orbits. This is the outer belt. This is the inner belt. You can see this is one of those um, sudden particle enhancements at low L shells, flooding the slot region at these lower energies. And then over the course of the next several orbits, the two belt structure was carved back out again. And what Jean-Francois Ripoll was able to show with simulations using uh, diffusion coefficients that were derived from observed data, um, as well as several models, that this reformation of the slot region is entirely consistent with uh, pitch angle diffusion from um, scattering by Hiss waves. And the time scales as well, the energy dependent time scales, which is what's being shown over here, are completely consistent with that as well. So we can explain this uh, kind of unexpected, um, but very interesting time variability uh, for the slot region and inner belt. Okay, now shifting to the outer belt, first talking about sources. Um, one of the key things, key results from Van Allen probes, and one of the, the main reasons it was um, actually launched, one of the, the prime science objectives, was to disambiguate uh, through observations between two loss, or sorry, two source processes, uh, two acceleration processes, inward radial diffusion versus local acceleration. And what we've seen um, time and time again now with acceleration events in the outer radiation belt electrons are growing peaks in electron phase space density profiles for fixed adiabatic invariance. And that, of course, is a telltale sign of local acceleration. I have multiple examples shown here um, from these different papers. Uh, and another nice thing, too, is that just because the local acceleration is causing the initial enhancement, that doesn't mean that radial diffusion is not also active. Uh, Hong Zhao also showed in a, this JGR 2018 paper that after the initial enhancement um, at energies up to a couple MeV, a few MeV, you can then have further acceleration by inward radial transport and diffusion from the, the peak in the population. Um, so basically, if you have this example down here, this local acceleration causing this growing peak at L star of about 4.2 you can have further acceleration and enhancement at higher energies uh, by inward radial diffusion from that peak. Um, and that's what's being shown in this Zhao et al. paper, which is another key one to mention there. All right, so acceleration and the importance of substrum activity. Um, this plot is basically summarizing this nice figure here from Horn 2007. 
which shows the energy dependence on the acceleration mechanisms in the system. So for one to 300 keV electrons, you have a source in the, in the plasma sheet, the magnetotail, which can be injected um, or driven by enhanced convection into the inner magnetosphere. Those particles in the you know, one to a few hundred keV range will drive chorus waves, which can then accelerate the higher energy electrons, those several hundred keV electrons up to MeV levels, causing those growing peaks in phase space density. From those peaked distributions, you can then have outward diffusion, which is a loss process, and inward diffusion, which is a source process, leading to higher energy uh, at lower L shells. Those two sources, so the um, substorm injection and inward diffusion needs a phase space density distribution that looks like this, right? Monotonically increasing with L or radial distance, whereas the local acceleration of the higher energies requires peaked, growing peaked distributions. And when we look at stati statistics from enhancement events, as well as radial distributions going to higher L shell shells than Van Allen probes can observe, we see this nice transition point in the radial distributions at around 300 MeV per G which corresponds to a few hundred keV at geosynchronous orbit, in which you have uh, positive radial distributions um, versus L star for the lower energy electrons and negative distributions for the higher. And then from Van Allen probes, you can see those peaks. And again, that transition point at around 300 MeV per G. Uh, this is entirely consistent with local acceleration by um, interactions with VLF chorus waves. And Alex Boyd is preparing these results now, um, showing the statistics from uh, the core enhancement events from the Van Allen probes era, um, in which this is now mu and K. You have these positive radial gradients for electrons at lower energies, and these negative radial gradients for electrons at higher energies, where this black line is showing 500 keV mapped into this space. Um, again, entirely consistent with that local acceleration mechanism. Um, we're not the only people saying this, uh, just based on the last few slides. These are some um, uh, other, sorry, nice examples um, uh, consistent with this picture here that substorm injections really do play a critical role for uh, the outer radiation belt MeV electrons. Um, summarized really nicely in this figure from Allison Janes. And then what this figure is showing is just multi-point. So this is MMS, Van Allen probes B, Van Allen probes A. Uh, correspondence between injected electrons at uh, less than 60 keV energy and then lower band chorus being enhanced um, and, and lit up basically when those injected electrons show up at these different spacecraft. You can see the timing really nicely there with the injection and the, the, the chorus enhancements. All right, there are some really interesting outstanding questions and ongoing challenges related to electron injections from the plasma sheet and how they can serve as sources for the outer belt electrons. Um, there are some open questions on the complexity of the, elect the injections themselves with some, uh, some papers to uh, refer to here. In particular, I'm highlighting this, um, this figure from Sterathia et al. in uh, JGR 2018, which shows the localized nature of these injections. Um, Christine has also done a ton of work on this, and you got to see that if you were on uh, for her seminar um, a few weeks ago. Um, we do know that you can have direct injections of MeV electrons associated with substorm activity, but they are very infrequent. Um, why they are so infrequent, we don't know. That's an open question. And then some work that's actually going on right now. This is from a, a paper that I'm preparing. Um, these are combining phase space density distributions from Van Allen probes, which are the ones at the low L shells here, and MMS. These are for relativistic electrons. And what we see here is more than sufficient source in the plasma sheet at very high L shells uh, compared to what's, what the peak in the outer belt is for these relativistic electrons. Yet for some reason, injections tend to be very limited to about below 300 keV or so. Um, so these electrons may be there in the, sh the plasma sheet, but they're just not making it in for some reason. So that's an interesting outstanding question. I'm going to breeze over the losses really quickly. Um, dropout events are extremely sudden. I'm talking about hours, uh, drastic orders of magnitude decreases in flux in the outer belt over a wide range of energies in L shells. Um, we think we have some good explanations for why that's occurring. You can see these review papers here. And I'm also going to highlight these uh, results from Xiang et al. 
um, which I think are excellent studies, uh, including the statistical one here in 2018, showing that both interactions with EMIC waves and magnetopause losses in outward transport are important for MEV electron dropouts uh, and the losses that are occurring with those, those events. And there's a significant L dependence on um, which, loss is, which loss process is dominating with the magnetopause losses in outward transport dominating at higher L shells being L, L star greater than about four and the EMIC waves often dominating at lower L shells. Um, not to say that the EMIC waves can't affect higher L shells, just uh, that's statistically um, what's dominating. Remnant belts um, associated with dropouts. This is where you get those double outer belt structures. Um, so if we look at these Pinto et al. results uh, from Victor, you can see right here, this is the double outer radiation belt. And again, breezing over this slide super quickly, um, we know that these are really just remnant belts that are left over after a dropout has uh, basically eroded the vast majority of the outer radiation belt. Um, and then you have a subsequent enhancement and subsequent acceleration resulting in this two belt structure. And the plasma pause, which is shown in white here, is a critical boundary there um, because it actually acts as the separation point between those two, um, enabling that distinct two belt uh, two zone structure. Um, I know that Allison Janes and I think Adam Kellerman have done some work as well showing that you can have even more, you know, you can repeat this process multiple times and get even more structure in L shell of these belts. Uh, the key thing though is that they're remnant belts after dropouts for the, the lower L shell um, belts there and um, that these are common. Uh, uh, Victor uh, showed that there have been more than 30 of these events during the Van Allen probes era. Scattering by EMIC waves. Um, like I said, this is a very relevant loss process. I'm going to rip through this really quickly. Um, you can see uh, Maria's paper here, which shows the really nice pitch angle dependence on that loss process, as well as energy dependence on that loss process. And then um, Assay of it all has this really nice set of results showing how you get this telltale phase space density uh, distribution evolution in time, completely consistent with losses from um, EMIC waves. So that's another great paper there. That's actually, I think, some of the clearest evidence we've seen yet, um, alongside, of course, these energy and pitch angle dependencies that uh, Masha has highlighted here. Okay, this one I wish I could spend more time on, but I cannot. Uh, this is looking at microburst precipitation, um, which are these very sudden enhancements in precipitating electrons observed at LEO. Just some really key highlights. Uh, Mike Shumko in a GRL 2018 was able to show, uh, as far as what we know, the first observations from near the equatorial region of, um, of microbursts. So he actually saw the microbursts uh, near the scattering uh, region, um, which revealed the strongly nonlinear nature of these, um, which I think was no surprise to anyone. Uh, and then even uh, our just equal interest here is now that we've started getting multi-point observations of precipitation and precipitating electrons at LEO, uh, we've been able to actually see that there's some very interesting spatial and tempor temporal features of microbursts. Um, and we can split them into these two families, uh, one being curtains, which are spatial structures, and one being flashes, which are kind of the traditional temporal burst of loss that we thought, what, what, what we first interpreted microbursts are with these single spacecraft observations. Um, but once you add two spacecraft now, like we have with AeroCube 6, where you have two following very close, one going through a structure and then another following through either that structure or not afterwards, you can actually disambiguate uh, the spatial temporal nature of these things. And what that's shown is you have these two different flavors of microbursts. Some of them are these, these curtains, which are really just very narrow uh, in latitude, which is corresponding then, of course, to L shell, these narrow spatial structures that are in the drift loss cone, in which you can have spacecraft separated by over a minute in time along a common orbit, passing through this spatial feature, and then another one coming over a minute later and passing through the exact same spatial feature. That's what's being shown here with the two point AC6 measurements. And then you've got these temporal flashes of precipitation which are also really interesting because those have to be in the bounce loss cone only. When your second spacecraft comes through, that feature isn't there anymore. It was just 
a flash observed by both spacecraft simultaneously and then it's off. And that tells you that there's been no uh, drift loss cone um, uh, signature that's been left over. Uh, and the cause of these things is apparently nonlinear scattering by chorus waves. Um, and they're possibly a byproduct of acceleration. This is really neat. Um, as well, I want to highlight too, just really quickly, Mike Shimko has done some fantastic work on estimating the size of these uh, structures and, and flashes. Um, and that's also consistent with this picture of them being related to chorus. Um, finally, uh, on loss, um, just highlighting a little bit on the ELFIN mission from UCLA. Um, ELFIN was launched in 2018 and we're starting to uh, get the, the data product now in really good shape. Um, the key thing with ELFIN, it's, it's the first pitch angle distributions within the atmospheric loss cones and of really high interest here. Uh, these are three second distribution data that you can see. These are um, pitch angle distributions. I, I should say these are pitch angle distributions um, for different energies with the energies listed here. This is an omnidirectional um, energy distribution. This is an energy distribution in the anti-bounce loss cone. So these are actually coming out of the atmosphere. This is the trapped uh, slash loss cone mix population. And that of course is altitude dependent. And then this is the bounce loss cone uh, energy distribution. Um, but this anti-bounce loss cone is really interesting. We're seeing very significant amounts of, of, of electrons coming back out of the atmosphere, even though those went down in the bounce loss cone. Um, so that's a really interesting result. You can see here too, some of the really nice structure uh, on the precipitation observed by Elfin. This is just one pass through the outer radiation belt. Um, so there's just a wealth of data coming from that spacecraft. Those, I should say spacecraft, there's two of them. I'm gonna skip storms entirely and just get to the last few slides. I, but there have been some really nice statistical studies and I apologize that I can't highlight these further. Um, again, these slides are gonna be, this recording uh, is going online. So you can see these slides and uh, see the, the references that I have listed here. Um, but we've made some really significant process as well in understanding the storm time variability of the outer belt electrons. Um, some of the mysteries of which were outlined in these uh, two papers from O'Brien and Reeves. Um, Kyle Murphy, the, one of our hosts here, uh, did some excellent work on this. And I can refer you to his GRL 2018 paper um, in which he basically showed that there's this really repeatable pattern of very strong, you know, more than 90% true losses of the pre-existing outer radiation belt. And then a second phase during the recovery phase of very rapid acceleration, which may or may not enhance the population back up to the pre-storm levels. Um, and then there's also, so Sam Bingham uh, with some of his thesis work actually showed that statistically there were growing peaks for the radiation belt electrons in the relativistic range. Um, and again, that transition point of about 300 MeV per G or a few hundred KeV uh, above which you are seeing growing peaks and below which you are not. Um, so that's more statistics backing up that local acceleration mechanism. And then this paper here just showed that uh, that basically the, the flooding of the slot region and reformation of the slot at the lower energies was indeed a, a general feature of storms. All right, now getting to some of the interesting stuff is radiation belts throughout the solar system. I can breeze over this slide because these are the planetary bodies in our solar system, the significant sized planetary bodies that do not have radiation belts. And that's just because they're insufficiently magnetized. So Mercury is the sole one here that actually has a proper, as we would call it, magnetosphere. Um, the rest of these do not, as far as we know. I, New Horizons did not have a magnetometer, sadly. So there is that question mark there. But um, I think we can confidently say that none of these systems have uh, significant intense populations of trapped radiation. Now, getting to Saturn and the ice giants, um, there are some really interesting questions here associated with these systems. I mentioned Kennel and Petschek uh, earlier, and this figure from Mock and Fox 2004 is, is really important to understand that um, because these are basically the most intense observed electron spectra at those systems where this is energy of the electrons on the x-axis and intensity uh, on the y. Um, and then these have been compared with the, the Kennel Petschek limits for those systems. All of these are consistent with the Kennel Petschek limits except for Saturn. And the reason we think Saturn is not is actually because of additional losses because of those beautiful rings around that system. 
Um, so we think that's why Saturn is kind of an outlier here and, and sitting so low. This is a super interesting one because this is showing the mass plasma density in the system versus electron intensity. And what you see here is Uranus is a, a distinct outlier. Um, and we don't know why that is. That's a really intriguing open question is how does Uranus have such a relatively strong electron radiation belt environment when it lacks a significant source population? That really has to do with its distance away from the sun, that lack of source population. Uh, but what you can see here, there are indeed intense radiation belts at each of these systems. Um, however, we know essentially nothing about the time variability of these, in particular at Uranus and Neptune. These are just from single flybys. Um, so knowing how variable Earth's radiation belts are in time, I, I think it would be really naive of us to assume that these are fixed pictures. And um, these are just snapshots of a potentially very uh, highly variable system. Um, so I want to stress here that ice giants uh, also offer a strong relevance to exoplanetary systems and what we can understand about um, radiation belts outside of our own solar system. So there's just a wealth to be done still at these planetary systems. And then there's the behemoth, Jupiter itself. I, by several metrics, the Jovian magnetosphere is the solar system's most efficient particle accelerator. And if you want to debate me on that, I'll point you to the trapped populations of greater than 50 MeV electrons. Um, this is, these are synchrotron emissions uh, here. That's the, basically the outline of, of Jupiter itself. Those synchrotron emissions at that frequency are from 50 MeV electrons. Now that's a relativistic factor gamma of 98.8. Um, these are extremely, extremely ultra relativistic. Um, how Jupiter produces such intense levels of such relativistic electrons I, it is still an outstanding question. And there are many other outstanding questions, including, of course, time variability of that system. We've had extremely few spacecraft um, that have actually gone through the equatorial heart of the electron or sorry the, the jovian radiation belts um so we haven't had anything like van allen probes to actually look at the the time evolution of those uh, radial distributions of phase space density that would be fantastic to have a jupiter uh, we also know that jupiter has a very interesting ion radiation belt system which gets even more complex because of the interactions with the various moons uh, eo which is of course pumping out a significant amount of plasma into the system but then the other moons as well, which can um, act as sources and losses themselves. So Jupiter's radiation belt offers this really unique in situ opportunity for us because we can actually get to that system to understand much more exotic astrophysical systems. And just as a teaser, this is the last slide before my, my uh, conclusion slide. I, radiation belts throughout the cosmos. Um, we know that radiation belts are common at the, at the sufficiently magnetized planets in the solar system. So I think we can safely assume that they also exist outside of the solar system. Uh, some systems that have dipole-like rapidly rotating magnetospheres, um, some astrophysical systems like dwarf stars, pulsars, this is a nice image of a pulsar from uh, the other R. Kelly here, uh, and then black holes and accretion disks. And what we learn in the solar system can inform us about more universal processes that may be causing uh, extreme acceleration throughout the cosmos. Um, this is another nice figure from uh, one of Barry Mock's papers showing the upper end of the, the Jupiter electron spectrum and energy, and then the inverted electron um, spectrum from emissions from the Crab Nebula. Uh, and you can see there's pretty interesting uh, similarity between the slope of those curves there um, in the overlap region. Um, so my main point there is that we really should be using the radiation belts and observations of the radiation belts throughout the solar system for comparative studies to better understand the regions that we cannot go into uh, uh, directly in situ throughout the rest of the universe. And that's where I'm going to leave it um, with Earth. We still have plenty to learn. I've highlighted some of the, the main findings of Van Allen probes, but there are many, many outstanding questions that Van Allen probes has just left us uh, with. Um, we have JAXA's RSA mission, ERG, 
the Air Force's DSX mission and um, upcoming soon the GTO SAT mission from NASA. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some future dedicated multi-point space weather observatories traversing the belts as well. Van Allen probes were deactivated in October of 2019, and um, we now no longer have these equatorial measurements uh, like we had. It would be fantastic to have multi-point coverage in the uh, equatorial radiation belt um, for both science purposes and, and future studies, as well as for ongoing space weather uh, monitoring and climatology. Also needed is more multi-point observations of electron precipitation. Um, there are some exciting uh, missions in the pipeline here. And I think we should continue pushing this because what we've seen with these multi these few multi-point uh, observatories that we've had is that the precipitation in the atmosphere is a lot more complex than what we originally gave it credit for. And we also don't understand enough, I would say, about the impacts of those energetic particles on the Earth's atmosphere itself. Some of these electrons can penetrate right down into the stratosphere. Um, and of course, when they're depositing their energy, they're affecting atmospheric chemistry. So there are some really intriguing outstanding questions there. And then, like I just stressed, I think we should be sending dedicated instrumentation and hopefully dedicated missions to the other radiation belts in the solar system to learn more about both their unique aspects compared to Earth, as well as universal processes in each system. And I will leave it there. That's all I have. Thank you. Excellent. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. True. That was a good overview of the radiation belts. Of course, there's a lot of material to cover, so I yeah. wish we had yeah, more sorry time. I a bit over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, but we will, as you said, we will upload these slides online for people to catch up and see it later on. Uh, we have quite a few questions, so we're going to get going with that. Uh, the first question is from Marisa, and she wants to know a little bit more about uh, South Atlantic anomaly. Please. Sure. Um, so, like I said, the South Atlantic anomaly is a result of Earth's dipole moment being offset from the center of the Earth itself. And the South Atlantic anomaly is actually uh, the closest to the Earth itself where trapped pop the trapped populations um, in the radiation belts get. Um, and that's why I was saying that the conjugate point to that is actually where the drift loss cone ends up dumping all of its particles. Um, so what you have with the South Atlantic anomaly, and there's a really nice, uh, Wei Chao too has some great figures in one of her papers from, I want to say 2009 or 10, showing this geometry with the offset um, of, of Earth's dipole moment uh, from the center of the Earth. And you can see really nicely with those figures, the geometry of why at that particular longitude um, and latitude, you end up getting these really intense populations of uh, uh, radiation belt particles. And it's really just because that's you're seeing the trapped population there, whereas in the rest of low Earth orbit at different latitudes and longitudes, you're seeing um, uh, various levels of the bounce loss cone and drift loss cone. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Dave Pitchford. Is there a conclusion to the debate on whether larger than 1.5 MeV electrons have been present in the inner belt before RBSP period? Yes. Um, so I don't think there's any debate. I think there have been. Uh, they just didn't reside um, at observable levels um, into the Van Allen probes era. We can say with confidence that there were none at observable levels in the Van Allen probes era. We can also say that the cosmic ray source um, is generating some, but again, they just weren't at intensities that were strong enough to be observed by the Van Allen probes instrumentation. Um, those are the things that I'm willing to say confidently. And I, uh, to, to just go back the, the times that we have observed them were from the Cress era. Um, so, so for example, those observations uh, of the injection, that shock injection from Cress, we know that those were electrons because of the drift periods. Um, so we know that that corresponded to at least greater than 13 MeV electrons uh, in that inner zone. So they have been there, they just didn't hang around or last uh, into the Van Allen probes era. Okay, thank you. 
So the next question, we actually had some replies in the chat box, so I'm going to put it to you anyway. Uh, does the CRAN source rate change with solar cycle? Is it less uh, at solar max? And the question comes from Patricia. Yes, absolutely. So um, galactic cosmic rays, of course, have a solar cycle uh, modulation. Um, so during solar maximum, you actually have lower levels of galactic cosmic rays, a lower intensity. And that's because the solar wind transients, um, like coronal mass ejections, sweep out uh, um, cosmic rays that are inbound upon the Earth um, in the heliosphere. Uh, so during solar maximum, you have lower levels, lower intensity of galactic cosmic rays. And then during solar minimum, when the solar field uh, and solar transients are at lower levels, um, you have more galactic cosmic rays. So the source crammed from those, that variation also goes with the solar cycle. Thank you. The next question comes from Katrina, and she wants to know for which solo wind and IMF conditions are the microbursts most often observed? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Alex Crew had some, some statistics on microbursts. I cannot remember the year, but that was in the last decade. Uh, and I think you, that was, those were statistics using SANPEX. I want to say 2016, but don't quote me on that. Um, and the microbursts go really well with chorus activity. So uh, the solar wind drivers that are preferable to driving chorus activity, um, in particular, uh, chorus activity goes really well with the AL index. Um, and the, of course, the solar wind that, that correlates well with AL. Uh, the, those tend to basically go hand in hand within the microburst activity. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Jingqin Li. And it's regarding one of your last slides, I think, on 1 MeV intensity chart. Where does the earth lie in the plasma density? Oh, um, that was on. It was towards the end of your yeah. slides. That was this one here, right? I think so. Earth obviously has a, a high plasma density. It might even be off scale here. Um, I would need to check. I'll, I'll just refer you to the, the Mock and Fox uh, paper here. Um, I'm pretty sure Earth would be off scale here, but I'd refer you to that paper instead. Yeah, thank you. We will try to put those uh, references online later if we can. Uh, okay, the last question from Antonova. It's possible to observe discrete aurora at low latitudes during magnetic storm due to the equatorial shift of the aurora oval. What is the role of such shift in the outer radiation belt formation? In the, in the formation of the outer radiation belt. So I don't know if the, hmm, this is, there's a lot wrapped into that question. Um, they're related, I would say. I, during active times, you, and by that I mean geomagnetic storms. So during geomagnetic storms, um, you initially have the dropout phase in which upwards of 90% of the pre-existing outer radiation belt is eradicated. It's, it's truly lost. Um, associated with that is the, the DST, um, uh, expansion basically of L shells, um, which contributes somewhat to that loss actually, uh, both from an adiabatic sense, which is not true loss as well as in the true loss sense. Um, so the whole system actually expands outward uh, in physical space. Um, and then during the recovery phase that compresses back in, and this is conservation of the third invariant um, that causes this. So with, then this is where I'm not, I'm not an expert on auroral physics. Then this is where I'm getting tied up with the, uh, with the comparison here, because with the um, auroral oval shifting to lower latitudes, that's of course moving to lower L shells. And then with um, the radiation belts during the main phase expanding to higher radial distances, 
um, you then end up getting basically this, this stronger overlap uh, between the convection um, coming in from the plasma sheet and the injections coming in from the plasma sheet with the core outer belt population. Um, and again, just to reiterate one of the points I made, those that enhanced convection and those injections of those tens to hundreds of KeV electrons are critical for providing the source of chorus waves and the seed population that is then accelerated by the chorus waves to MeV levels. So there is some relationship there and I'm going to stop babbling because that's really what I've been doing there. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. That was a great talk. Very enjoyable. I would like to remind everybody to please join us next week on Monday at the same time. Uh, Vanya Giordonova will be talking about the ring current. Um, so please do join us. And Drew, that was great. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Have a good day, everyone.